listened to my friend instead of my boyfriend, and now she got me in trouble and my BF is gone. Morning and still went out. When I came back home late, it was emptied and he was gone. Sometimes we tend to do things our own way because we want to prove that we can do this the way we want to and the way we feel like. He had addressed the issue of me always going out at night, and I ignored him. My mind was made up, I didn't want to miss out. I had some sort of FOMO, fear of missing out, in me. I felt like if I listened to my boyfriend, I would miss out on a good time. Instead of listening to him, I listened to my friends and now look at what that had got me. How I wish I listened to my boyfriend and not my friends. When I was left alone, when I found him gone, where were the friends that I had listened to? They were long gone also, and I was left all alone licking my own wounds. I wish I had done differently. Maybe if I had listened for once and obeyed. I wouldn't have found myself in a tough situation that left me confused and depressed. I almost lost myself that time, and I don't want the past to repeat itself. My name is Molly, female, 24, and my boyfriend is Raj, male, 26. Raj and I met through a mutual friend, well, my girls and I had gone to one of our male friend's birthday party celebrations in Washington. Raj was Liam's male friend childhood bestie. We didn't know about him up until the day of the party. Raj is a very handsome guy, smart, neat, and sophisticated. He was a fun person. You wouldn't get bored when you are chilling with him. He's very cool, calm, and carefree. Raj and I chilled together throughout the night. Our energies and personalities connected in a way that I had never expected. We got along very well. We ended up exchanging numbers. My friends started complaining that I had been with Raj for way too long and I had ditched them. Some people would never understand when your heart and soul connects with someone, you will feel like you can be with that someone for as long as you both live. Raj and I became close friends since then. We liked and enjoyed each other's company. What made our relationship the way it was, it was because we both knew how to communicate with one another. We managed to put our differences and pride aside and talk things through. Another thing, if we are together, the conversation always flows. It was always like if I was out of something that I would speak about, he knew how to make up a conversation. We spent a lot of time together to a point that even my friends started getting jealous of the way I was close with Raj, but I didn't care. The more I was spending time with Raj, the more my feelings for him were developing like a speed of light. I had to pretend like I was not feeling anything while deep down I was dying of this guy's love. You know the pain when you have to act like nothing is happening in you while there's actually a huge bomb that you want to drop, but you are scared of rejection. Three months later, Raj and I started dating. We just couldn't keep our feelings in the closet anymore, so we both confessed our true feelings. Our relationship had its share of ups and does, but we managed to pull through everything through trust and communication. Our relationship was a bliss. We did everything together. We would sometimes go out together to have some fun alone. He allowed me to be free and to be myself. My love for Raj grew fonder and fonder. I had found a best friend, an advisor, and a lover in him. He was my perfect, imperfect situation. Though he had a tendency of going out whenever he got angry or things didn't go the way he was expecting them or the way he wanted to. Another thing about Raj was that he cannot handle or cope well under pressure especially if it's relationship pressure. He prefers walking out and coming back when the situation is handleable. We dated for two years, but during our first and a half years, things started changing. Raj became distant. He would sometimes come back from wherever he was coming from, moody and uninterested. Mind you, that time I had moved in with him, I moved in with him on our sixth month of dating. He actually begged me to move in with him because he felt like his apartment was lonely and cold without a female figure. After the whole month of convincing and begging he did, I finally gave in and accepted his request. I mean, I was in love with the guy, so I thought, why not accept his request? So I remember one day when Raj was Raj's birthday. I had planned to make a nice, intimate, and romantic dinner for him while I would surprise him with my sexy number that I had bought specially for his birthday. I had cooked. When I say I cooked, I mean I went all out, made all his favorites. I even lit the candles and did those romantic decor things. I made it like a romantic and intimate picnic kind of thing. I waited for Raj that day. I even tried calling him, but he was not answering. In fact, he had switched off his phone when I tried to call him for the third time. From there, I saw that he was somehow ignoring me or avoiding me. I asked myself what was happening with him and asked if I had done something wrong. 
because the way he was acting made me think that maybe I had done something wrong, but I was not aware. I stayed the whole night that time, and even dozed off on the couch. The surprise was ruined, the birthday romantic intimate picnic was ruined. He stood me up, which was something he had never done before. I was so disappointed and heartbroken by what he had done. He actually came back the following day later. I didn't even know what to say nor do to him because I was so disappointed. I had wasted all my time and energy for him to make his birthday kind of special. Only for him to stand me up like that was the worst part, to ignore my calls. Not just ignoring, but he literally switched off his phone when he saw that I was blowing his phone up. In my mind, I had thought that maybe I was a nuisance to him. Maybe I was no longer the girl that he had fallen in love with. Maybe he was not finding me interesting anymore. All those thoughts kept lingering in my mind. They came rushing like a flood, and whenever they did, I would get crushed. My heart would be torn into tiny pieces. I didn't know if I was going in or going out in Raj's life. A lot was no longer promising, and I was actually waiting for anything to happen between us. I tried, you know, I tried being patient with him. I tried addressing the issue with him, and he told me that there was nothing wrong between us. He told me that he was dealing with some work pressure. He apologized for the way he had been behaving and promised to change for the better. As much as I did not believe what he was saying. His apology sounded sincere, so I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I wanted him to prove himself without me going after him like he was a herded cow. Few days passed and he didn't change his behavior. Instead, it got worse to a point that we even argued. There's this one time when I was asking him if he no longer feels me or no longer finds me interesting. He asked why I was asking him that. So I told him all the reasons that I thought he wanted to know so he would know his mistakes and rectify them. Instead of him to keep calm and speak with me in a civilized manner, he decided to just burst out. I was so confused by the sudden burst out so I asked why he was being defensive because I was asking questions and he had to give me simple answers. The argument went on and on until it reached the peak point where it got heated and he decided to just walk out on me and go wherever he was going. I was left there shuddered. I missed my friends. Somehow I was starting to regret ever getting into a relationship with Raj because he had no backbone. He didn't know how to stand up for his SH asterisk T and it was somehow pissing me off and turning me off. On the weekend, I decided to just text my friends and ask what their weekend plan was. As I was waiting for them to respond, Raj walked in and asked to speak to me. I gave him a go ahead. Then he started by apologizing for the way he was behaving and for walking out on me. He told me that he had found out something bad about Melissa, one of my friends, female, 26. He told me the most shocking things that I didn't even want to believe because Melissa was like my best friend, my sister. He told me that Melissa was a body seller. After her parents passed on, she had no place to go, so she resorted to selling her body to old men. That came as a huge shocker to me, but that was not all because he dropped the biggest bomb of them all. He told me that Melissa had been with some bad guys and she owed a loan shark, moneylender, a huge amount of money since her parents didn't leave her with anything. So the moneylender wanted his money back or she should find a girl that would satisfy the man sexually until he says she has paid off her debt. Raj told me that all the other three friends of mine or ours actually knew about Melissa's problem, since they also date older men to make easy money. I had been warned by my boyfriend Raj not to go out late at night, especially after the recent news of my bestie or my so-called ex-bestie Melissa and the shenanigans that she had put herself into. But I had plans with my friends and I didn't want to cancel on them. Yes, they had replied, and I didn't want Raj to manipulate me or emotionally blackmail me to stay in the house after I had stayed for too long tolerating his nonsense. So I ignored his warning and set out for a night out on the town. We had planned to meet up in town before we went to the club that my friends had recommended, not knowing that I was actually setting myself a very dangerous trap. My mundane routine consisted of work, occasional social outings, and returning home by nightfall. One day, however, curiosity overcame my usual cautious nature, leading me down a path of unforeseen consequences. It was a typical Saturday evening, and the sun was setting, casting an orange hue over the horizon. As I prepared for a relaxing night outside the house, a friend called me and told me to meet them at some newly launched club so that later we would join a spontaneous gathering at a popular nightclub downtown. Feeling the monotony of my life, I seized the opportunity, ignoring the warning that lingered in my mind. 
My boyfriend has always been a reliable source of advice, cautioning me about the perils lurking outside after dark. Raj pleaded with me and even threatened to leave if I went ahead with my plan of meeting up with my friends. As much as I loved Raj so much, but he had disrespected and disregarded me so much to a point that I even saw myself as a nuisance or an irritating girlfriend to him. I needed a break and some air to breathe. I needed to be away from Raj and going out with my friends was actually what I had needed. Little did I know that that unknown Saturday night was going to be my worst nightmare. Disregarding my boyfriend's words of wisdom and warning, I hastily dressed up, slipping into a stylish outfit that exuded a newfound confidence. A quick glance in the mirror reassured me, and I headed for the door, keys jingling in my hand. As I stepped outside, a cool breeze brushed against my cheeks, reminding me of the dubious choice I had made. Ignorantly dismissing any nagging doubts, I set off into the unknown. The vibrant city lights welcomed me, transforming the dark night into a swirling kaleidoscope of colors. Pulsating music reverberated through the air, igniting a rush of adrenaline within me. For hours, I danced, laughed, and mingled, soaking in the contagious energy of the crowd. It felt as if time stood still, as if this was the destiny I had been searching for all along. I wanted to forget about my relationship problems and have fun. I had a great time with my friends, laughing and dancing the night away. But as the night wore on, I started to feel a sense of unease. I checked my phone and saw that it was past midnight. I knew Raj would be worried sick about me being out so late. I decided to call him and let him know that I was safe and that I would be home soon. But when I called, he didn't answer. I thought maybe he had turned off his phone or was in a different room, so I tried calling again a few minutes later. Still no answer. I started to feel a sense of panic. Where could Raj be? Why wasn't he answering my calls? I tried calling our neighbors, but no one had seen or heard from him. I decided to head home, hoping that Raj would be there waiting for me. When I was about to go, Melissa told me that she wanted to introduce me to someone else. I wondered who that was, so I agreed to be introduced to that person. I mean, what Raj had told me earlier had long gone out of my head, so it didn't come to me that I was going to be introduced to the money lender. Melissa took me to some small office and told me that that was where we would meet the guy. With my ignorant self, I said okay. So we went in and found a middle-aged guy, I think he was mid-50 if not 60. She introduced me to him as the friend she was talking about. I got confused and looked at Melissa, hoping to get clarification of what she was talking about. But the girl just avoided eye contact and told the guy that she would leave us alone to have a chat. My mind raced back to Raj. I had thought that if Raj was to find out about this, he would actually explode. The middle-aged man introduced himself as Isaacs. I didn't even introduce myself, I just looked at the guy and waited for him to tell me what his story was. The guy furthered by summarizing the Melissa story that Raj had told me about. He told me that Melissa told him that she had talked to me, and we have agreed that I would be the girl that would satisfy him until Melissa's debt was fully paid up. To say I was shocked would be an understatement. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So my friend, or the person I had considered my best friend, actually sold me to the devil. She borrowed or took money from this Isaacs guy with the hope that I was the one to pay the price. I told the guy that I had never talked to Melissa about anything like that, and I didn't even know what was going on with her. One thing I was grateful for was that the guy was kind enough to allow me to explain to him why I said I didn't know anything while Melissa was so sure that I was the one to be the guy's sexual toy. I told the guy my truth and asked him to let me go because I had a boyfriend at home that was waiting for me. The guy looked disappointed and enraged, but he kindly allowed me to go. I couldn't believe Melissa. I mean, how can you do that to your friend? Even if it wasn't your friend, how can you sell another woman to a man just because you want her to be used so that your debts can be paid off? I regretted ever going to that club, I regretted even texting the girls and asked for their weekend plans. From there, and then I knew that I had to rush home and apologize to Raj for not listening to him when he warned me. The alcohol-induced bliss still clung to my senses, making me oblivious to the world around me. I hailed a cab, slurring my words as I clumsily mumbled the address of my home. As the taxi raced through the empty streets, the graveness of my predicament began to unravel in my foggy mind. Arriving at my street, a shiver ran up my spine as I noticed my house standing eerily quiet amidst the darkness. 
Stumbling out of the cab, I approached the front door, misplacing my keys in my inebriated state. The door creaked open, greeting me with an unexpected silence. Tripping over my own feet, I stumbled into the living room, only to be confronted by a heart-wrenching sight. When I arrived at home, my heart sank. The house was dark and empty. I called out for Raj, but there was no answer. I tried calling his phone, but it went straight to voicemail. I prayed and hoped that he didn't do what he said he would do if I went out with my former friends. How I wish I had listened to him. He told me the exact same thing that the Isaac guy had told me, and I regret myself for not believing him. I should have trusted my boyfriend and listened to his warnings. But what did I do? I messed it all up. All for what? For a grudge that I had held on him. I searched the house, but there was no sign of him. I checked his phone and saw that it was still in the living room next to the couch. I tried calling him again, but it went straight to voicemail. I felt a chill run down my spine. Where could Raj be? Why had he left the house without taking his phone or any of his belongings? I couldn't shake the feeling that something was very wrong. I spent the rest of the night pacing back and forth, trying to call Raj and hoping that he would answer, since he had a second phone which was not in the living room. But he never did. The next morning, I found a note on the kitchen table. It was from Raj, and it said that he had left me. He was sorry, but he couldn't be with me anymore. He had packed his bags and left the house. I felt like I had been punched in the gut. I couldn't believe that Raj had just left me like that, without any explanation or goodbye. I was devastated, and I didn't know how I was going to move on from this. It's been a few weeks now, and I'm still trying to come to terms with what happened. I miss Raj, but I know that I need to move on. I'm trying to focus on my own healing and moving forward, but it's not easy. I wish I could turn back the clock and go back to that night and try to change the outcome, but I can't. All I can do is sit here and cry. My home had been stripped bare, devoid of the memories and belongings that defined my existence. Each room was an empty shell, devoid of life and purpose. Panic engulfed me as I realized the gravity of my actions. Desperation clawed at my throat, and my heart pounded, sending tremors throughout my body. Unfathomable regret seeped through my veins as I finally discerned the reason behind the tragedy that befell my once-cherished sanctuary. My foolish decision to ignore my boyfriend's admonishments had paved the way for my boyfriend to leave me and find someone else better. Every valuable possession, each priceless memento, had vanished in an instant, leaving only an indelible emptiness behind. Broken, I sunk to the floor, tears streaming down my face, mingling with the remnants of my shattered dreams. The consequences of my recklessness echoed mercilessly in my mind, urging me to reconsider my choices. It was a sobering realization. My actions had consequences, and the price I paid was immense. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months. The memory of that fateful night haunted me, serving as a perpetual reminder of the naivety that had marked my path. The love of my life, the only person who had shown me genuine love and care, never returned, and I was left to my own devices to rebuild my life from the ruins. It always breaks my heart whenever I think of the way my relationship with Raj ended. I miss him, and if I was to be given a chance to rectify my wrongs to save my relationship with Raj, I would. Even though I still think he took a very dumb and cowardly move to end our relationship, he should have waited for me to come back so we would talk about everything and find a solution to our problems. I now knew that the story he told me about was true, and it had been haunting me ever since. Ever since that day, I still get shivers down my spine when I think about what Melissa wanted me to do with that old man. I hate them so much, I no longer want to see myself associating with any of them. However, from the ashes of despair, a newfound strength emerged. I resolved to heed the warnings of those wise enough to know better, to never put my safety and security on the line. With unwavering determination, I transformed the gaping hole within me into a source of motivation, giving rise to a vigilant and astute version of myself. I decided to start therapy, which is the first route to the healing journey right. I had to make peace with everything for my own good. Thus, although I lost my material possessions, I gained immeasurable wisdom and resilience. As I gradually pieced my life together, I undertook a mission to share my cautionary tale and tirelessly echoed Mr. James's discarded words of advice to anyone willing to listen. 
For there is a profound beauty in caution, an inspiration within every tale of redemption. Please help me understand some terms of a relationship because I still don't know what went wrong in my relationship with Raj. I still need Raj. I miss him so much. What I should do to get him back. Please give me advice. I'm lost. Fairy tales. Growing up as a kid, I always loved fairy tales. I hoped that I would one day meet a prince that would sweep me off my feet and take care of all the bills and everything so I wouldn't have to lift a finger. That came true for me. I had such a good life and I messed it up because I wanted a few minutes of fun. I cheated on someone who cared about me so much and tried so hard for me. I know you're probably going to be wondering what I'm rambling about, so I apologize. I'm going to start from the beginning so you understand me. I cheated on my husband with his bodyguard and of course, karma came back for me. My husband absolutely destroyed me in court and I got nothing. Now I'm back to square one. I fought so hard to leave the slums and I honestly cannot believe that I am back here again, struggling and living from hand to mouth and surviving on food stamps. My name is Melissa and I am a 29 year old woman. I was married to Justin, a 29 year old man. We live in the US and we were married for about a year. We have two children, twins, who I'll call seven and light for the sake of privacy. They're both eight-year-old and I love them immensely, but they've always been more attached to their dad. I remember when I first met Justin and it was at his grandfather's birthday. I was 19 on the verge of becoming 20. Entering that stunning place, I was blown away. My dad worked as a driver for Justin's family and he got this unexpected invite to Justin's grandpa's big birthday bash. The whole thing was super fancy with everything dripping in luxury. Looking around at all the fancy stuff, that's when I spotted Justin. He wasn't hard to notice, dressed to the nines and practically radiating wealth vibes. As everyone mixed and mingled, here comes Justin, strolling over in his fancy clothes. I was honestly shocked. Someone from his world talking to someone like me with my background? Surrounded by people clamoring for his attention, he went out of his way to chat with a girl like me from a less well-off family. His move felt real, a bit of kindness in a sea of extravagance. Back then, I had no clue that this moment was just the start of something way beyond our different lives. As the night went on, Justin's friendly vibe pulled me in even more. Even though everything around us was super fancy, he seemed actually interested in getting to know me. We maneuvered through the crowd of dressed up folks, and he led me outside, away from all the bright lights of the party. Underneath the huge night sky, Justin started talking about stars, making it feel like they were old pals. It was kind of surreal, just standing there in the quiet, far from all the fancy stuff going on inside. Surprisingly, Justin, who you'd think would be all high and mighty, decided to give me a crash course on how to act all proper. He could tell I was feeling a bit awkward in this world of rich people, so he took the time to teach me how to handle myself. From eating at a fancy table to chatting without making a fool of myself, Justin wanted to make sure I didn't stick out like a sore thumb. While he shared his tips, I couldn't help but appreciate how genuine he was in trying to bridge the gap between our lives. That night was way beyond what I could have imagined. Not just because of all the fancy stuff, but because I unexpectedly connected with someone who looked past our different backgrounds. As I was about to leave the fancy birthday party, Justin smoothly asked for my number, saying he'd keep in touch. A few days later, he messaged me, asking if I wanted to go out. I was curious, but a bit cautious, wondering what he was up to. When we met up, Justin explained he just wanted to be friends. I agreed, and our first hangout was at this super posh restaurant, way fancier than any place I'd been. The fancy vibes were a bit overwhelming. Nah. During the night, we chatted about what we liked and didn't like, and Justin, being the friendly guy he is, shared more tips on how to handle fancy situations. It was kind of funny, but he wanted to make sure I didn't feel out of place. Despite the swanky setting, we connected over real conversations and shared experiences. I was impressed not just by the fancy stuff, but by how Justin tried to make our worlds meet. It turned out to be a night filled with laughs, learning, and unexpected friendship. I immensely enjoyed it. On our second date, Justin had this idea that since he'd already shown me his fancy world, I should show him what it's like in my neck of the woods. So we spent the day chowing down on street food and doing all sorts of things that I was pretty sure he'd never be caught dead doing because he's so posh. 
It was a riot seeing his face trying out street eats, stuff way different from his usual high-class meals. We hit up lively markets, did some random activities, and Justin found himself in situations that were far from his usual polished routine. The whole day turned into a mix of laughs and spontaneous experiences. One highlight was me teaching him how to skate. Picture this fancy guy wobbling around, determined to get the hang of it. Hilarious and kinda cute, to be honest. It felt like we were breaking out of our usual routines, finding joy in the simple stuff. By the end of our day, we'd shared a bunch of laughs and got to understand each other a bit more. Our journey from that fancy party to officially dating happened crazy fast. Like, seriously wild. A guy from the rich side and a girl from the not-so-rich side getting together? Who saw that coming? But love does this funny thing where it doesn't care about backgrounds. And that's exactly what happened with Justin and me. Sure, his parents weren't thrilled about us being a thing. Our different backgrounds didn't sit right with them, given their high-class status. But despite their concerns, there wasn't much they could do to change the fact that Justin loved me, and I loved him right back. Our relationship turned into a roller coaster of emotions, from the excitement of being with someone so different to dealing with the challenges of our totally opposite worlds. Even though Justin's parents weren't exactly on board, our connection was real and strong. It wasn't about money or where we came from. It was about two people who genuinely cared for each other, ready to face the complications that came with our different backgrounds. Less than a year into our relationship, Justin and I found ourselves facing an unexpected twist. I was pregnant. It hit us like a ton of bricks, and the whole situation felt surreal. I was overwhelmed with a mix of emotions, feeling a bit crazy and not knowing what to do. One day I just broke down. I was scared and had this nagging fear that Justin might bail on me, but he didn't. Picture this, me in tears in the bathroom and Justin walks in, genuinely concerned. When he found out it was because I discovered I was pregnant, he didn't freak out. Instead, he laughed a little, gave me some words of encouragement, and reassured me that we'd face it together. In that vulnerable moment, Justin's support became a lifeline. We were scared, no doubt about it. Becoming first-time parents is no joke, but the fear didn't matter because we were in it together. Justin, driven by his own experiences of emotional absence from his parents, wanted to break that cycle. He was determined to be there for our kids in ways his parents hadn't been for him. Of course, when his parents found out about the pregnancy, they weren't exactly thrilled. They accused me of trapping Justin, but he didn't let their negativity get to him. When our twins, Seven and Light, finally arrived, it was a mix of joy and chaos. Early parenthood hit us hard sleepless nights, non-stop diaper changes, and a constant juggling act. But holding our little ones made it all worthwhile. Let's be real, keeping up with two tiny humans wasn't a walk in the park. Thankfully, Justin's parents stepped in to help. Despite their initial hesitations about me, they couldn't resist falling for their grandkids. Their support became a lifeline during those exhausting days when coffee was our best friend. It wasn't all rainbows and butterflies. Parenting brought its own set of challenges, and trying to figure it all out with limited sleep was tough. But having Justin's parents around, ready to lend a hand and share their know-how, made a world of difference. As Seven and Light grew, Justin's parents stayed involved, becoming a big part of their lives. Despite the rocky start, the love they had for their grandkids helped us a lot. Jump ahead a few years, and the twins were growing up fast, almost hitting six. I was getting closer to 28, same as Justin. Life had changed a lot since those early days. Justin had been a rock star partner and dad. He didn't just lift me out of the tough times. He took care of everything. Bills, responsibilities, you name it. Even though I had a solid education, I hadn't jumped into a job. Instead, I embraced being a full-time mom while Justin held down the fort. Getting used to the perks of a comfortable life took some time, but Justin's support made the whole transition smoother. I went from struggling to pay the bills to having some room to breathe. Justin must have decided that it was finally time to pop the question because he took me out of a picnic and proposed to me. I was ecstatic and happy, even though I loved marriages. I had never really pushed for Justin to pop the question because I knew it was something that took time. Justin and I were all in for planning our wedding, and the kids, Seven and Light, were over the moon about it. Their excitement added a special touch to the whole process. 
But not gonna lie, things got a bit tricky with Justin's parents. Despite the years gone by, they still held a grudge. They weren't exactly thrilled about me, calling me a gold digger and all that. When they heard about our wedding plans, they were pretty mad. Eventually, though, they simmered down a bit. Maybe the sight of us as a family helped. My parents, on the other hand, were all for it. They liked Justin, saw the love we had, and were totally on board. Their support made the wedding planning way smoother. At first, Justin and I imagined a simple wedding. You know, low-key and cozy. But his parents had different ideas. Being all about status, they insisted on something big. So we landed on a compromise, a destination wedding, planning that Shindig was a whole adventure. We had to find a spot that pleased Justin's parents, but still felt right for us. The venue, the guest list, and all those cultural bits needed careful thought. When it came to our bachelor and bachelorette parties, we were on the same page. Separate parties, no craziness. We'd seen some friends go all out on their last night of freedom, and we wanted to keep it in check. Justin's party had the kids around, so no wild stuff there. He's a loyal guy, and the idea of risking our relationship for a night of chaos didn't sit well with him. Plus, with Seven and Light in the mix, he knew they'd spill the beans on anything off kilter. For my bachelorette party, things took a different turn. Since we didn't have daughters and Justin was a bit protective, he suggested taking his male bodyguard along. At first, I thought it was a bit odd and checked in with the bridesmaids. But since our plan was more about girly fun and far from anything wild, we figured it'd be fine or so we thought. So there we were with Marco, Justin's tall and good-looking bodyguard, who, despite looking like a model, was known for being more than just eye candy. He could handle his security gig like a pro. We kicked off my bachelorette's party early in the day. We started with the usual stuff spa time, a bit of shopping, just some regular girl fun. It was a great day, with a few drinks thrown into the mix. But as the night rolled in, the girls and I, carried away by the idea that it was our last night of freedom, thought, why not spice things up a bit? Yeah, looking back, I can admit it was a bit of a silly move. But in the moment, excitement and a couple of drinks got the better of me. Now I had this weird belief that promising not to cheat on Justin was some sort of magical shield against doing anything foolish. So in this slightly tipsy state, the girls and I cooked up a plan to hit a strip club. The catch? We couldn't ditch Marco, our ever watchful bodyguard. So in a playful moment, we made him swear to keep our little adventure a secret from Justin. Marco, finding it amusing, went along with it and promised to zip his lips. Off we went to the strip club, chasing a bit of spontaneity on what was supposed to be a night celebrating the upcoming wedding. In the middle of the strip club fun, we decided to amp it up and booked a private room. We kicked off keeping things chill, just soaking in the vibe. But as the drinks kept coming, we all started letting loose. In the midst of the party, I couldn't help but notice Marco more. He was looking extra handsome, and this sneaky thought crossed my mind. Would he spill the beans to Justin if something went down? At first, I tried to shake off those thoughts, blaming it on the booze messing with my head. But as the night rolled on and the alcohol took over, those reservations faded away. In the heat of the moment, I found myself kissing Marco. It was a slip, a decision I'd later regret. But in the haze of the night, I suggested we continue later, acknowledging that I'd crossed a line. And after the strip club adventure, we headed back to the hotel. The reality of what happened hit me, and my earlier promises felt like a distant memory. Back in the hotel room, things took another unexpected turn. Marco sneaked in, and lines that should have stayed put got crossed. What followed was an intimate encounter, a result of choices made under the influence and the thrill of the moment. The morning after that crazy night, I was hit with a huge wave of horror, the truth smacked me. I'd messed up big time, cheated on Justin, and broken his trust. The guilt weighed on me, and I was drowning in questions. What was I going to do? How could I face Justin, the guy I was about to marry? At first, I freaked out about Justin finding out. I figured my friends were just as hammered as me and probably wouldn't remember much. Plus, Justin didn't really like my friends, so I was banking on him not taking their word for anything. In a twisted way, 
I tried convincing myself that the messed up details of that night would fade away in a boozy blur. Oddly enough, Marco, not as bothered as I was, started spinning this story that it wasn't entirely our fault. He downplayed the whole mess, blaming it on the mix of booze and spontaneity. Call it stupidity or whatever. But somehow, I started buying into his excuses. It was a twisted way to cope, a messed up justification for something that should have never gone down. As the wedding date inched closer, panic set in. The idea of confessing to Justin seemed impossible. Spilling the beans about cheating right before our vows? No way. I couldn't bring myself to wreck Justin's view of our relationship on the brink of our wedding. So I made the stupid decision to keep it all locked up. I told Marco how how whatever happened between us needed to stay in the past. It was a feeble attempt to draw lines, a desperate move to regain some control over a situation that had spiraled out of control. But of course, that was impossible. Our wedding was a real spectacle, all grand and fancy. The kids couldn't stop talking about it for days. It was a happy time, and the memories stuck with us, creating this warm glow around our new family. In the midst of all this, Marco somehow convinced me to keep our secret thing going, promising that Justin would never catch on. I knew it was a dumb move, but I went along with it. Looking back, I can't believe what I was thinking. A few months into our marriage, Marco and I started this affair. After our honeymoon, we slipped into this routine of deceit. The kids loved every bit of the honeymoon, as said it was their second favorite after the wedding. Behind the scenes, though, I was caught up in a mess of lies. I began making up stories to fool Justin. I'd come up with scenarios that supposedly required Marco as a bodyguard, all while secretly heading to hotels under the pretense of needing security when, in reality, it was for some secretive rendezvous. The whole charade went on for months, creating a complex web of lies that was tearing at the seams of our marriage. The guilt and inner struggle got worse each day. Playing this risky game of deception, the trust holding our marriage together started to crumble. The appeal of secrecy and the excitement of forbidden moments clouded my judgment, blinding me to the potential fallout of my actions. While our family looked perfect from the outside with the big wedding and happy honeymoon, underneath, I was a disloyal and deceitful wife lying to my husband. The stark difference between the public image and our private reality created a confusing conflict that I had a hard time making sense of. Life can be unpredictable, you know? That saying about things coming to an end eventually and karma hitting back hard? Well, they hit me like a ton of bricks. So picture this. It's a day after one of my secret hangouts with Marco. We roll up to the house, Marco in the front with the driver, and me in the back as usual. We park, and as I'm about to head inside, a message from Justin pops up on my phone. I open it, and it's a video. I don't play it. Instead, I think I'll just ask Justin about it since we're both home. But here's the crazy part. The moment we step out of the car, bam, Marco gets arrested. Turns out he's slapped with theft charges. I'm standing there in shock because I know Marco wouldn't steal anything. It has to be a setup, but I'm clueless about who would pull such a stunt. The cops fill me in, explaining that some diamonds disappeared from our place. And when they searched Marco's stuff, there they were, carefully hidden. I'm flabbergasted and there's nothing I can do. The police haul Marco away, but before he goes, I promise him I'll get him a lawyer. Now, here's where it got worse. I'm pretty sure Justin's pulling the strings behind this because he's the only one with enough authority in the house to do that. So I march inside to confront him and get some answers. So after Marco gets hauled off by the police, I head into the house feeling a mix of shock and confusion. Why on earth would Justin go after Marco like that? I know Marco isn't the stealing type, so there has to be some hidden motive in Justin's move. Justin, my usually sweet and kind husband, is also capable of being remarkably ruthless. Imagine me wandering through the house, noticing that the kids are nowhere to be found. I go on a little hunt for Justin and eventually stumble upon him in the study. I inquire about the kids, and he calmly informs me they're at his parents' place, which isn't unusual. The kids often spend time there, he then asks me if I watched the video he sent, and I admit I haven't. I proceed to question him about why he decided to have Marco arrested. In a departure from his usual straightforwardness, Justin suggests that I watch the video for answers. 
It catches me off guard because Justin isn't typically cryptic or mysterious. Intrigued and somewhat apprehensive, I pull out my phone to check out the video. As I nervously opened my phone to watch the video, I tapped on it, feeling a mix of curiosity and dread. The video starts off a bit dark, but then it becomes clear, revealing a scene that hits me like a ton of bricks. Me kissing Marco from that messed up night at the strip club. I was shocked, lost for words, trying to wrap my head around how Justin got his hands on this video and what exactly he knows. Questions flooded my mind. Where did Justin find this video and what's the extent of his knowledge? In the midst of my shock, I was frantically brainstorming ways to fix the mess in my marriage. I know divorce might be on the table, but I was desperately hoping there was a way to patch things up. The big unknown is what Justin knows. Does he only know about that one regrettable night at the strip club? Or is he aware of my ongoing thing with Marco? It's a crucial factor. And the realization that Justin might be onto my infidelity sends my mind into overdrive. I was torn between confessing everything and bracing for the consequences or downplaying the strip club incident as a drunken mistake. If Justin only knows about the night at the strip club, then I could tell him I was just drunk and beg his forgiveness. But if he knows about the secret affair, then there's no saving me. Tears well up in my eyes as Justin, cool and collected, silently watches my emotional turmoil. He shows no emotion on his face and I wonder what he's thinking. In the middle of my breakdown, recalling the simple advice not to put all your eggs in one basket, I broke into tears and started pleading with Justin. I painted a picture, explaining it was the result of being too drunk, and my friends practically dragged me to the strip club. I tried every trick I could think of, but Justin just stared at me. Then he hit me with a question that made me shut up. Did your friends also push you to take him to hotels too? I was shocked. I came to a brutal realization. I had seriously messed up. There was no turning back. Maybe if I had owned up to the affair when I first saw the video, instead of spinning a yarn about it being a one-time thing, Justin might have considered forgiving me. But the look on his face made it crystal clear. Forgiveness wasn't on the table. He dropped a harsh ultimatum, 30 minutes to pack up and leave. The catch? I could only grab my phone and the clothes on my back. Everything else, he claimed, was his. Staring at the wreckage of my life, the reality hit hard. I depended on him for everything. In a raw admission, Justin confessed to setting up Marco's arrest, ensuring he'd serve time. He said it was a brutal consequence and a stern warning for anyone messing with someone else's marriage. Justin, when angry, was downright ruthless, making any attempt at talking pointless. I did what he asked, just left. The plan was to wait until he calmed down and then come back, beg him to reconsider. But that plan quickly went up in smoke. The moment I walked out, Justin decided to take things up a notch. He sent that damning video to everyone we knew, his folks, my folks, literally everyone. You can picture the joy on his parents' faces, finally thinking they were right about me being a gold digger. Now, broke and without a backup plan, I had to swallow my pride and turn to my disappointed parents, the same people I tried escaping by marrying into Justin's wealthy world. The irony hit hard. I used to depend on Justin for everything, and now that dependency was biting me back. And the video? Turns out, my so-called friends were the culprits. On the night I thought no one cared about what I was doing with Marco, they were sneakily recording everything. What's even more messed up? They decided to send that video to Justin after our wedding. The timing didn't make much sense to me. Why wait till after the wedding? But at that point, I didn't care for explanations. Fueled by anger and betrayal, I cut them out of my life for wrecking my marriage. Marco was about to face trial for theft, but in the midst of my personal chaos, I didn't bother visiting him. I had more significant issues on my plate. Did I ever mention that I signed a prenup? Maybe not. I had signed a prenuptial agreement before marrying Justin, a mandatory condition set by his grandfather and parents. It was the one thing we couldn't contest, and that decision came back to haunt me during the divorce. Justin unleashed a legal storm that left me with nothing, absolutely nothing. The courtroom battle was brutal, and I lost custody of the kids. Justin absolutely destroyed me in court. I didn't even get custody of the kids. Because while in the courtroom, yes, the kids were present, with the way they were clinging to Justin, it was obvious they were very attached to him. 
And also, considering how dead broke I was, it was obvious the judge wouldn't give me the kids. Justin had a means to take care of the children. The judge granted me only weekend visits. We hadn't even been married for a year, and thanks to the prenup, I practically left the courtroom empty-handed. To add insult to injury, the judge didn't mince words about my infidelity with the bodyguard, further deepening my humiliation. Justin's strategic legal moves and the prenup combined to obliterate any hope I had of a fair settlement. The only positive outcome I got was that I didn't need to pay child support. So that's my tale of how I messed up my marriage for a fleeting moment of excitement. Justin never found it in himself to forgive me. Though I get weekend visits with the kids, it's crystal clear they favor their dad. Life feels like a reset. By putting my story out here, I hope someone learns a thing or two, steering clear of the mistakes and pitfalls that tripped me up. Thanks for lending an ear.